All right, we are recording. Thanks, Tyler. Good morning or good afternoon, I guess it is now, as we just hit noon, and I can't believe that we're partway through June already. I blinked sometime in April and woke up in June, it seems. I think we've all been running at a pretty quick pace. Um, I would just uh, like to welcome everybody. I'm Tracy Walter, President and CEO of the Chamber, for those of you that don't know me. And I would like to call, uh, to call on Kyle Burgess, who is our vice chair on our board with Minkin Employment Lawyers to welcome everyone today. Kyle. Thanks, Tracy. Hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to see you all. Uh, as Tracy said, I'm, my name is Kyle Burgess. I'm the vice chair of the New Market Chamber of Commerce uh, and also a senior employment lawyer with Minkin Employment Lawyers. On behalf of our board, I would like to thank everyone for joining us uh, here today for this very important Zoom meeting. Um, the focus of our conversation, as I'm sure everyone is aware of, is on COVID recovery efforts and the next steps for the economy uh, with a national, provincial, and local lens. Um, of course, I'd like to first introduce our very distinguished uh, speakers for today. Uh, to begin with, we have uh, the, the mayor of Newmarket, John Taylor, joining us. Uh, we also have the president and CEO of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, Rocco Rossi and also the Director of International Affairs for the, Chinedi uh, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and that's Mark Agnew. Um, also, uh, there are a number of other individuals joining us today. Uh, MP Tony Van Bynen is with us. Uh, Don Gallagher-Murphy from uh, MPP Christine Elliott's office. Uh, Trevor McPherson, uh, the Vice President of Member Services from the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Um, and then from our town council, in addition to our mayor, uh, is regional councillor Tom Vey and councillor Christina Bizens. Um, in addition, uh, from our board here at the Newmarket Chamber of Commerce, we also have our treasurer, Pierre Bonhomme, joining us as well. Uh, so I know everyone probably has a very busy Friday here today and has made time for this, this hour Zoom meeting. Uh, so I, I want to hand the reins of the meeting back over to you, Tracy, so we can get to the speakers and, and the topic to be discussed ASAP. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, in many regions, today marks uh, the phase two of the reopening. And while we aren't at that stage yet, we'll be watching closely as our neighbors uh, reopen. We wanted to get a perspective at a national, provincial, and local level today. Um, most times people would start nationally and narrow it down to a local level, but because new market is beyond the ordinary, uh, we want to start locally and then we'll work our way out nationally. So um, I will turn it over to you, um, John. But just uh, after we hear from the three speakers, we're going to open it up for a Q&A. And I'm going to have Abdus Samad, who are, is our Director of Government Relations and Policy. He's going to help me facilitate that Q&A today. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to John. Uh, Mayor Taylor, sorry. Thank you very much. I, I I'm, uh, can't wait to get home today and tell uh, my wife that I'm very distinguished. Um, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to milk that all weekend. Uh, and uh, it's look, it's great to be here with everybody. I really enjoy uh, coming into these Zooms and uh, hearing people's questions and what's uh, what's sort of percolating out there and where some of the challenges are and where people are feeling a little more optimistic. I, I think in general, I don't know about others, but I'm, I'm starting to see some uh, some glimmers of optimism and some excitement about opportunity that lies ahead of us. And I can sort of uh, starting to feel that uh, sort of bubble up in the community, which is, is fantastic. Uh, you know, so uh, as we move forward, we're, we've got a lot of opportunities, um, um, but it's gonna, as I always say, it's gonna re require us working together. Um, so I thought I would start, uh, as I have in the past, just with some COVID numbers for New York and New York region. I'll warn you, uh, this, is a, this is a um, graphic content warning. I will share some, uh, uh, some information with you that I got from the Medical Office of Health yesterday. Uh, and I found it a little um, disappointing, a little, uh, a little concerning, but I think it's important that everybody knows it. So um, brace yourselves. Anyway, uh, the, um, the York, York region right now has just over 2,000 cases. Uh, 462 of those are active cases. And there are 225 deaths uh, across York region related to COVID-19. So, you know, I think it's uh, important to keep that in mind as we realize how important it is for us to, uh, to really stick to those guidelines and uh, and adhere to the guidance of our, our medical professionals in, in order to contain this and manage it so that we can continue to open up and get business moving. Uh, New Market has 223 cases. The great news there is, is out of 223 cases so far, we only have 23 active cases right now in the entire town, which is great. Uh, and uh, there are 22 deaths. And of course, the majority of those are in care, but they're still very meaningful. 
Uh, so uh, the we had a we had a about an hour long, a bit more than an hour long uh, conversation with our chief medical officer of health yesterday at York Region, uh, Dr. Kareem Kurji, who I as I've told you before, I hold an incredibly high regard. Uh, he works uh, with uh, medical officers of health across the province, the country, and even internationally. Um, and uh, I, I asked him to, to point blank. I said, "Look, I, you know, hope, we we hope and we believe that on Monday we may hear, may hear that we're entering phase two, uh, probably with uh, to, to actually." Uh, implement on the, the following Friday or the Friday. Um, I said, do you, do you, uh, when you, when you uh, review our numbers, do you support that? And he said, he does support us moving into phase two, uh, that he thinks the numbers are very, uh, very uh, positive and very uh, reason to be uh, hopeful. Uh, he cited the fact that typically the new uh, cases in York region each day are in the high teens, whereas at peak they were in the 50s and 60s. I'm certainly in the 40s for many, many days. Uh, so you know that is good. The number of uh, um, uh, you know, number of local transmissions uh, are are quite low, and that's where they concern themselves the most. And the, uh, the the case reproduction number is still right around one, which is where they hope to keep it or below. Uh, and so there there's reasons for them to be very optimistic about where things are trending in the community. Uh, it seems like uh, all of the hard work and the, the suffering uh, many of your businesses have endured over the past couple of months is is paying dividends. Um, Later in the conversation, and this is where I provided the warning, later in the conversation, he shared with us that, um, uh, that and he said we, meaning his colleagues and himself, uh, and I believe he means medical officers of health at large, uh, are expecting a second wave. I don't think that comes as a surprise to anybody. A second wave in September to November, possibly as late as January. Best case scenario, he said, was that the second wave would be equal to or greater than the first wave. And the worst case scenario is that it would be two to four times uh, as, as large. I found that very sobering um, and concerning. I'm trying to get more information about it now. I suspect we'll maybe be reading more about it uh, um, as this is discussed more. I haven't heard these kinds of projections elsewhere. So um, we'll try to find out more. But I think the real message to take away there is that uh, we've got challenges ahead of us still and ensuring that the public continues to take social distancing seriously, that all businesses enter this and ma manage their spaces in an incredibly safe manner. Because I believe if it's at the lower end of the projections, uh, because we're so much better now at managing our hospital capacity, at tra tracing and tracking and testing, that that won't require us, even if it's at the earlier peak, to go backwards or close down. And that's what he indicated. He said we're in much better shape that way. But if we see significant increases uh, to the degree he suggested could happen, um, you know, uh, it, it's hard to say what we could be looking at. So, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to be uh, to depress everybody on a Friday, but I, I think the public needs to recognize because I said it before, I'm witnessing uh, a loosening of, of people's um, uh, commitment to uh, some of the social, uh, some of the medical advice we're getting. And I think it, it, we just need to, sh to share the word and, and, and make sure that everybody understands that our ongoing commitment as individuals and businesses uh, are going to be very important right now to to the landscape in the fall, um, and I and I and I believe we can do that, and I believe we can manage uh, through it. But I think it's uh, and I'm not exaggerating those points to to try to coerce people into certain types of behavior. That's the information I was provided. Um, so we it, it looks very much like we're moving into stage two. I mean, we may be surprised. Uh, I uh, maybe it's another week, but I, it looks, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, like we will hear on Monday. Uh, and I don't have inside information, but uh, certainly that's all the signals seem to be suggesting uh, that we're moving into stage two on Monday. Uh, and with that uh, comes uh, by Friday, if, it, if they uh, mirror things, the uh, opportunity for some further openings. Um, on the town front, we're, uh, we are looking at uh, camps, uh, modified camp program. I won't dwell on that too much because I'm not sure that this audience is that, although I'm sure there are some people who are interested, but it's it is a very hard thing to, to do to run camps. Um, some of the bigger cities are trying it, uh, others will try it, but with the guidelines that the province has provided, which I think are, are very good guidelines, but they're extremely restrictive and as they should be, especially when you think about the information I was just discussing. Uh, that means that uh, running camps are gonna be very uh, labor intensive, a lot of process, um, uh, not as and perhaps entertaining and certainly more costly. Uh, and, and certainly will serve far, far fewer residents um, because of the ratios, et cetera. Uh, so we're not sure if we can do it uh, effectively yet, but we're looking at that. Uh, we'll also be looking at opening splash pads, uh, probably with the second phase opening um, and a few other things along those lines. And we can get into that more if you want. 
Um, obviously, the bigger one uh, we've discussed in, with the chamber and with the BIA is the patios. We are uh, we're moving rapidly to try to get a patio program in place. It's it's largely in place, and we're working through with uh, uh, with businesses. This can apply across the town. There's a lot of interest in the downtown. I assume we're going to start to hear more interest from others across town. Uh, the LGCO and uh, starting to give uh, guidance on what can and can't be done, um, and I'm sure you can get those details. But uh, uh, we're, we're, we're putting in place a program. We're going to do everything we can to have it ready. Um, but uh, if they announce on Monday to have everything in place for Friday will be tough, but that's still our goal, um, but can't guarantee it. Uh, but I, we think that's going to be very advantageous. We're also open. I think it's really important to make sure that this word spreads. We're very, we're still open in the downtown and elsewhere uh, to uh, non-patio uses. Um, my understanding is there's an opportunity for retail uh, other retail to have a presence uh, perhaps out on the sidewalk or street within the same similar uh, same pat, uh, parameters as the patio program and we're open to exploring that so if you want to reach out to our economic development uh, department on that as well uh, we're happy to have those discussions anything we can do to assist and support uh, uh, the businesses and the business community uh, we'll try to do it and through as quickly as we possibly can of course uh, all the other programs that we've uh, stood up are still running or our uh, you know, shop local program, our business assistance concierge program, uh, the mentorship access program. Again, I encourage people to consider accessing that program. There are some phenomenally skilled and talented uh, uh, um, business owners uh, and, and uh, uh, executives uh, that, that are re at the ready. Some of them are already engaged, but not all of them yet. And you know, if it's just even a one-off conversation you wanna have on a specific challenge you have, uh, please contact our economic development uh, people about that opportunity as well. Uh, and uh, we've implemented 30 minute to drop off only parking on Main Street. And that's actually been very helpful to those, to the, to a lot of the uh, pickup drop off businesses and restaurants on Main Street. Um, and so we're learning a lot as we go. We're, we're trying to move uh, quickly and trying to be as supportive as we can and as nimble as we can. Uh, and so a, as always, we're also open to suggestions uh, that anyone has for uh, other measures or other ideas. Uh, and we'll continue to pursue what other people are doing in other jurisdictions. For example, I uh, intend to go and uh, uh, see how patio uh, openings and some of the lessons learned might be, and, and have a, we'll have a call with uh, Mayor Jeff Lehman and Barry after uh, they uh, get to experiment with that a week ahead of us. We might as well take advantage of that opportunity to understand how it's playing out. Even if it's only one week, it might give us some, some uh, save us some headaches or, or, or provide some insights and opportunities. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that is a lot of what's going on at the town in terms of the business, et cetera. Uh, the business programs, trying to move things forward uh, in terms of supporting businesses in our community or being ready for the next phase. Um, on top of that, uh, we're doing, and I think this is important, it should, it, to the, I hope it's important to the business community, we're doing a lot of work at the town and our staff are working uh, diligently to, uh, you know, to ensure that we're continuing the business of the town of Newmarket. Uh, so making sure that we're, uh, we're processing permits. I mean, you know, if we can process permits, uh, then people on this call in the construction industry uh, can also get work and, and, and advance uh, their businesses. So there's a lot of other businesses that need to advance and there's work we can do at the town to do that. Uh, we're, uh, we're actually accelerating our road paving program right now. You've probably noticed that around uh, New Lock, a watch will be moved to Davis Drive, Sanford, many other streets in town to try to accelerate that while it's less impactful. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is you might've had to wait on New Lock the other day for a minute or two. Uh, if this were under normal times, you might have waited six, seven, eight minutes. So we're trying to get those uh, in now while it's less impactful because it's logical to do. We're moving the Mulock Farm Park work forward, uh, some other park work, and we're working with some, uh, some, uh, some key um, applications to the town for, uh, for um, housing options because uh, we know that part of the success for a community relates to having a broad range of housing options uh, for people, everything from affordable housing to semis, to towns, to single family homes, to uh, condos and to rental. Uh, and so we, we, we're, we're really trying to ensure that we don't get uh, completely focused or uh, uh, taken off course by COVID. We have to respond and react and work with the business community, but we also have to make sure that the town and new market keeps moving forward because our long-term success depends on all of us uh, planning out beyond COVID and ensuring that we can uh, as businesses or as a town that we can continue to drive our local economy forward and make sure that this continues to be an incredible place to live and do business. So I think I will leave it there. Happy to answer questions later and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, in addition to the, um, 
the MAP program, the mentorship program that you mentioned, um, we did send out a note today, as did the Economic Development Office, in regards to some round tables that we're going right. to be doing with um, York University in partnership with York University and Sherwood School of Business and Wisconsin School of Engineering. So um, there's four different groups. One of them is manufacturing. One of them is uh, retail and hospitality. There is a entrepreneur and general business one. And I am missing one, Jennifer. Uh, test me. <laughs> You're testing me. <laughs> All right. Um, so in any case, we have sent those out. And uh, if you haven't seen that or you want to be a part of those groups, um, we definitely have those. They're happening starting next week, so you can drop Jennifer a line or just send one to info at And now I would like to take a provincial view um, and ask Rocco Rossi to address us today. And Rocco, I know you've seen and heard a lot through the network uh, across the province and what's happening as, as reopening uh, moves forward. Thank you, your uh, worships. And by that, I refer to both John and Tracy. <laughs> Um, uh, and uh, great to be here uh, on a Friday, which uh, my wife uh, uh, jokingly says uh, she loves uh, because there are only two days left in the work week, it seems, with, with this crisis where uh, we're all Zoom all the time and there's always something. Um, and um, so first off to all of, all of you and yours, I hope you're safe and sound and I uh, want to echo a little bit about what the, the mayor has said. The, the reopening is not a time for less vigilance. It's actually a time for more vigilance. Because the key to it being successful and not going backwards, particularly in light of potential second waves, and those who read their history will know that with the Spanish flu, uh, the second wave was actually significantly uh, more deadly uh, than, uh, than the first. So there is historical precedent uh, to subsequent waves of uh, viruses being more virulent and wider spread. And the way we avoid it being more virulent is, is to continue, uh, continue physical distancing, continue uh, etiquette around sneezing, continue the use of masks, uh, all of those things that are necessary. At the same time, um, we've been, uh, the governments that at all levels have been reacting at incredible speeds, and I know Mark will go into more detail, but just quickly, um, we continue to hammer at both the province and the feds over the rent subsidy program. It's, there's no other way to describe it, it's a disaster. Uh, the uptake is incredibly low. Uh, so this isn't a matter of opinion. Uh, it's the lived reality right now. Qualifying tenants are not getting the help that they need and they are desperate for it. And it is an unfair burden on many landlords to actually have them administer the program uh, and make choices between those who are in and those who are not. And, create all kinds of additional frictions uh, for themselves in, in this process. So that needs to be fixed. I am somewhat hopeful because the governments have shown their willingness to iterate programs once they come out and, and, and judge that, but maybe Mark can go into it a little bit more. I was in a round table the other day in terms of what's gonna happen with the wage subsidy program. Um, Clearly, it is significantly undersubscribed relative to what they'd originally uh, budgeted or anticipated it would be. So it will likely be extended. They will be looking at qualification measures. Uh, there's certainly a lot of, of emphasis on, on having more of a sliding scale as we go and as we reopen, because this is going to take some, uh, some time and, and it shouldn't just be an on-off switch at 30%, uh, but help to taper uh, businesses, uh, businesses in. Uh, a great deal of concern that as you reopen, if something isn't done with thinking about 
uh, the SEBA program, we're hearing from more and more members uh, in areas that were allowed to, uh, to reopen that their single biggest competitor for labor is the SEBA program. Uh, and um, so some uh, more thinking needs to happen uh, there if people are going, to, uh, uh, are going to want to go back to work. Now, clearly, we don't want anyone to be going back into an unsafe circumstance. So I took a great deal of comfort uh, from the Prime Minister's announcement with respect to more funds and, and the Premier's and the, the Prime Minister are going to debate how much the number is. 14 billion seems a little light, um, but really to focus on a couple of key areas. Number one, doing a much better job with our long-term care homes, because clearly these are the most vulnerable among us. It's been the highest levels of mortality. Uh, we simply have to do better. And as we go th through and potential second waves, uh, money has to be invested there, processes have to be looked at, protocols have to be looked at. Secondly, testing and track and tracing. Uh, very pleased, the provincial numbers yesterday was 28,000 tests, it's at a high water mark uh, and more capacity being put in. This is going to be crucial because tests are not vaccines, they're not one and done. Um, so you go, you have a test, you're negative, um, you know, you party for 35 seconds and then you realize that unless you behave uh, properly, you can still get uh, reinfected. So people have to be retested and as you open, you're starting to see larger companies uh, investing in their own testing capacity to be able to do that. It's certainly happening significantly in the US and I expect that will come here. In addition to testing, track and trace is absolutely crucial because if you're going to uh, limit any potential spikes coming out of infections, you have to be able to quickly trace and track those that someone who tests positive has been in contact with in the last several days. Um, and there's still a lot of work that needs to be uh, done on that front. We have not cracked uh, the code. Other jurisdictions have uh, national uh, mobile apps. Uh, Alberta has one. The other provinces, everyone has their kind of pet projects. The feds are looking at one. Uh, we need to get that in place uh, before the fall, before uh, potential uh, next, uh, next waves. PPE, um, it's great. All levels of government and many local chambers now have web pages and lists where you can find it. Uh, we're hearing from too many, two things. One, when they do order, a lot of things get back ordered and that's gonna become more problematic as more of the economy opens quickly so that uh, that supply and demand um, imbalances get, get corrected, that'll take time. But two is just cash. Uh, most SMEs have burned through uh, their cash and restarting is not a trivial uh, number in terms of deep cleaning, in terms of having the PPE, in terms of uh, retrofitting uh, your shops, where necessary plexiglass barriers at cash, moving to more uh, touchless cash uh, payment systems, uh, et cetera, that have been very successful for the grocery chains, but not everybody is a grocery chain. And um, so the prime minister talked about some of the strings being attached to this funds to, uh, to the province being attached to providing startup funds for businesses, uh, specifically for PPE. Province of Nova Scotia, New, uh, Prince Edward Island, and Alberta have all uh, set out grant programs for SMEs now to help them with, SM, with PPE purchases. We're talking to the provincial government uh, on that front uh, as well. Um, public transit and daycare. Uh, the two biggest things I hear aside from the rent subsidy program from our members, uh, they say to me, Rocco, look, I can do great work making my, uh, my facilities, my shop, my factory safe 
um, but my employees have to get to work. And if they can't get daycare, and if they can't travel public transit safely, and many of them are afraid to, uh, then that's a real problem. And that's also been part of the reason why, as, as unfair as it appears, uh, and look at nothing about this COVID crisis has been fair. It's all been unfair. Uh, governments trying to take a more regional approach and a slow approach is also to make sure that we can put the protocols in place um, to get through this as safely as possible. We saw the city of, uh, of Ottawa mandate masks in their public transit uh, system, given that the National uh, Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Tam, says that if you can't physically distance, you should be wearing a mask. It doesn't take much to connect the dots and look at public transit and say, well, in that case, pretty much impossible to keep social distance, physical distance. Um, uh, I want to see that as a minimum um, to give me confidence that it's, um, that it's going to be safe. Um, lots of other things that we can go into. Hopefully, we can do that in, uh, in the question period. But many positive steps forward, still some concerns, uh, and I can't underscore enough. Reopening does not mean, exactly as the, as the mayor has said, does not mean less vigilance, it means more. We all have a duty to make this successful, and that means doing it as safely and effectively as possible. Thanks so much. Over to you, Tracy. Right. Can I, Tracy, just quickly to add to Rocco's comments on transit, uh, um, Toronto also announced yesterday, right, that, that yep. masks are mandatory. Uh, and York Region uh, at our meeting yesterday also decided we will be doing the same thing. So I think that's going to be standard now. I expect that. And, and I, one, one final point I would add, um, because it's, it's, a financial, it's a financial concern, going into the crisis, all of the data indicated that for the average SME, they had 20 to 30 days of cash on hand. We have obviously gone well beyond 30 days uh, and we have lost many businesses, but many are still hanging on. And, and so many people are scratching their heads and saying, well, you had 20 to 30 days of cash on hand. You've gone past 30 days. How is this possible? Part of it is that they've indebted themselves more. They borrowed from friends and family. They've maxed out credit cards. But the single biggest thing, and this is a concern I have for municipalities, for the province, and for the feds, is all of those taxes and fees that have been deferred, people have been spending the money to survive. And so when that bill comes due, one of three things is going to happen. One, governments are going to have to agree to kick the can down the, the road further and extend and defer it longer. Two, you're going to have to write off a huge amount uh, that is not currently budgeted. Or three, we are going to have a massive second wave, not of the virus, but of bankruptcies, because people are not going to be able to pay that back. I don't know whether to thank you, Rocco, or <laughs> no, I know it's reality. And uh, um, Mark, you uh, you have a view from a national perspective and, and economies that have reopened at a, a, a different pace than ours and, and an international view as well. So I'd like to turn it over to you to, to kind of give us your thoughts. All right, thanks, Tracy, and um, thanks to you know you and the team for the opportunity to um, speak with your members here. I mean, you know the work that you guys do and that you know Rockwood does on the provincial level, um, you know, is top notch. Fighting for you know new markets, um, you know, interest in the in the national you know um, space. So, um, I mean, I, I think Rockwood covered off you know a lot of things that uh, you know kind of bleed over into the the federal level. So maybe I'll just kind of skate through things uh, a bit quickly, and then we can get right into the Q and A. Um, 
I mean, you know, for us at the national level, you know, it's been COVID-19 always all the time since March. Um, we've had our Canada Business Resiliency Network, uh, you know, portal that we've launched has been trying to have that really as a hub of information for folks um, that are on the ground to say, okay, well, you know, what are all the resources I need to have? What are the government programs that are out there? And, you know, what is it that I need, I need to know to be able to take advantage of those? Um, and we know that's been an incredibly frustrating uh, process for businesses to navigate the constantly, you know, changing, you know, programs, complicated program names, uh, requirements that are evolving. And um, in response to that, we've also launched our business resiliency service, which is a uh, toll free number that folk can call to speak with uh, tax experts to actually understand how do different programs apply to me? How can I navigate essentially through all the red tape and the nonsense to really just, you know, get to the cash flow and get to the help that I you know, need to have to keep my business running. So although, um, you know, my sort of, you know, majority of my day job uh, was doing international work, obviously doing a lot more domestic uh, stuff these days. So if there's anything that I can't answer in the Q&A, very happy to take that back to um, someone else on the team and make sure that you do get a follow-up response in a timely manner. Um, I, I mean, there's sort of six things that I would say at the national level that we're thinking about right now. Um, I think, you know, the first in, uh, on the list is, you know, access to uh, personal protective equipment. I and mean, we've heard from businesses across the country about the problems um, accessing, you know, this stuff either domestically or sourcing it internationally and getting products into the country. Um, we've actually, uh, initially we're asking the government to play a role with you know, a matchmaking service between, you know, those who are approved in Canada to make the products and those who need them. Um, progress wasn't frankly as <clears throat> coming as fast as we had hoped. So we've actually partnered with something called the rapid response platform, um, which is essentially a, you know, marketplace to connect those who make PPE with those who need it in order to, you know, get folks the stuff that they need. So if you haven't, uh, had a look there, but you do need stuff for your business, I would encourage you to go and check out that uh, resource. Um, the second piece is in some respects, you know, the most important for folks here, and that's around the government assistance programs. Um, we've been telling the government, uh, you know, Rocco alluded to some of these things with uh, the rental assistance uh, program, particularly being a problem uh, across the board and making sure that, you know, there's changes that will enable folks to actually realize the intended benefits of the program. But, you know, we've heard about the challenges, for example, with uh, the CERB and getting folks uh, to come back to work, the wage subsidy program um, on the international side. I know that the practicalities of the deferral of uh, duties and taxes on imports hasn't actually worked for a number of people in practice. So that's been a big priority for us. And, you know, certainly also if the government is looking at, you know, any phase outs of these programs at some point in the near future, that those need to be well telegraphed in advance to businesses so they understand um, that for their, uh, you know, operations and what it means for them. Um, point three, uh, childcare support Rocco alluded to already, and, you know, we're, you know, lockstep behind everything he said about, um, you know, being able to take care of, you know, loved ones, if you do want to, you know, get back to work and certainly as, you know, someone that has three kids at home, I, you know, really do appreciate that, you know, burden on a personal, you know, level and, uh, daycare is just now starting to reopen, um, is only kind of the first step in what I think will be a, you know, a long journey for whatever a normalization actually looks like. Um, point four is tracking and tracing. Um, I, you know, I think Rocco alluded to it, maybe I'll say it a bit bluntly. Um, it's just a mess out there with, you know, provinces having different apps and all this. I mean, you can imagine what it's like if you're traveling across a provincial boundary and, you know, the risk of putting yourself or others at, uh, you know, a risk of, um, you know, getting the virus if you're not, you know, registered on an app in that province or what that all looks like. It's, it's frankly a mess. And so certainly we want to make sure that if provinces are going their own way and exercising their, you know, provincial healthcare jurisdictional powers, that at least, you know, there's interoperability amongst the apps that people aren't falling through the cracks and inadvertently making the, um, the problem any worse than it needs to be. Um, point five is border reopenings. And I mean this both in a um, interprovincial sense, but also in a international context. Um, it, to say that this, you know, COVID pandemic has been disastrous for the tourism industry, I don't think genuinely does justice um, to the impact that tourism and hospitality operators are feeling. And, um, you know, the, the border restrictions, I think, were justified in the early days when we weren't sure about things. But now that we're starting to see a flattening of the curve. Um, and I think also just for people's mental health, being able to see loved ones that go across there, sorry, that live in a different province is absolutely critical for folks. 
And so we're calling on you know, the government to take a much more measured approach to these things. Um, on the international side, for example, we've said that the government needs to actually adopt a sort of hotspot uh, targeted approach. So instead of banning travel from all countries at once, instead identify where the hotspot countries and actually have targeted travel restrictions in place to at least enable some tourists to start coming back um, for an industry that's otherwise frankly gonna have to write off the 2020 tourism season. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is, um, you know, it's picking up on the mayor's comments around, you know, the potential impacts of a second wave. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think the world that we're in means we're likely to see some kind of snapback of restrictions or shutdowns if we do see a wave that certainly is two to four times as large as what we had this, this go around. And what we want to make sure is that businesses know well in advance what the kind of snapback conditions look like. Um, one of the really difficult parts about this was how suddenly everything did shut down. And this is not to say that a, you know, another shutdown is going to be any less painful, but if it's coming, I think you know, as businesses, you, you know, we need to know when those are coming so that we can plan accordingly for them. That if the numbers are trending up and we think that something might come in you know, a week or months time down the road, you know, take the mitigation action that you need early on to um, you know, leave your business a little bit less exposed. So I'll, I'll stop there, Tracy, and then why don't we just go right into the Q&A. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. And I think, uh, Abdus, I haven't been able to follow along the side, so I'll probably turn the Q&A over to you at least to start, if, and then I'll try to catch up a, along the side there. But I did notice that somebody um, added in for me that the, the other round table was the ICT group, Information Communication and Technology, and I'm surprised that slipped my mind because that's such an important sector for Newmarket and the York region in general. So that's the other grouping, and sorry about that. And the other piece uh, I just wanted to mention is that we published this week a reopening guide for Newmarket, which has links to a number of different resources, provincially, um, other jurisdictions, as, uh, Canadian, all of the different uh, regulations and, and advice reopening. So that is also available and uh, it was sent out, but it's available on our website, I believe as well. Uh, correct me can yeah. I just add one? Uh, can I add one more piece of information I forgot to mention to the uh, yesterday at committee of the whole at York Region, which means it's not fully approved until it goes through council. But yesterday, at, uh, there's if you can look it up online if you want at York.ca. Uh, if you find the agenda, there was an item on the agenda called COVID-19 Small Business Support, and they're contemplating adding $500,000 to a program called Starter Company Plus. Um, so for those who might want to get ahead of the curve, uh, have a look at that program to see if it applies to you. Um, or whether you could access it. Um, and if, again, that's not a final decision. In fact, somebody proposed an alternate uh, a, a path for support and that'll be debated at council next week. But um, just thought I would give everybody the heads up here that the Starter Company Plus is the name of the program and the report uh, is COVID-19 Small Business Support. Great. And I would just like to recognize that MP Tony Van Bynen has also joined us. <laughs> Did you have anything to add today, MP? You know, I'm, uh, I'm here to listen uh, primarily, and uh, I, A, congratulate the Chamber on the information that they're able to share on different programs for their members. You're serving your members well. Uh, uh, a great uh, good morning to Rocco and uh, the way that he's working with, uh, with Mary Ng on a national basis. Uh, so I'm here to listen, um, and we know that we've, we've proceeded with haste and not necessarily with precision and we know there's much more work to be done. Thank you. Abdus, did you have some questions lined up there? <laughs> sure. Um, first of all, thank you, everyone. Uh, that was uh, really insightful. Uh, Mayor Taylor, I, I, I hadn't had those stats on the second wave as well, and I'm, I'm plugged into a lot of those calls, so that was, uh, I have a bit more, uh, a bit of a deep dive I need to do. Um, so uh, I, I, Susan, you had a question. Um, did you want to ask it directly, or I don't know if she's still here. Oh, okay. Um, so Susan had a question. If the programs are expensive, will bursaries be made available in the interest of DEI access? Um, I don't know if anyone can answer that. 
We'll get back to that. Um, Chris, uh, Chris, um, are you able to unmute your line um, and ask? Yeah, there you go. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the Chamber for helping us achieve rent subsidy through RioCan because that's a, that's a big nut for us. So hopefully other people are able to access that as well. But I do have a question for the distinguished Mr. Taylor. Uh, understanding stage two is an estimated opening next Friday on June 19th. And I know you don't have a crystal ball. My business is lumped into stage three. When would you estimate the earliest opening would be of stage three? And then part two goes back to Rio Can. If stage three is pushed beyond July, uh, I no longer qualify for the rent subsidy. Is there any talk of extending that beyond the month of June? Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I know I don't have a crystal ball and boy, a state, stage two is hard enough to guess at. Stage three is a very difficult to, uh, you know, I, I, I'm hesitant to even speculate. Uh, the only thing I would say is, you know, look at where we are right now and the fact that there's a, a significant possibility with, you know, back to school and other things that we could see numbers increasing in September. That's not a, a, a large window. So, um, yeah, no, I, I don't think I could speculate on it. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know if Rocco has any greater insights or, or uh, but uh, I, I would think that'd be very hard to, to speculate on. Um, can't speculate on when the next phase, um, again, they're going to be looking at the, um, they're going to be looking at the, the numbers and quite frankly, the greater golden horseshoe, if you're, if you're following the data on a large uh, level, then, you know, we are the, we are the highest concentration. It's very similar in, in Quebec, you know, the greater Montreal area has the vast majority of the cases. And, uh, uh, and so in all likelihood, uh, the third phase will come sooner, um, to, uh, more remote regions than, uh, than, than for us in terms of the extension on the rent subsidy, um, I, I, I exp that, that is a very live conversation, um, but quite frankly, you know, as Tony uh, mentioned, um, governments are not really built uh, to move this quickly. Uh, and, and, and for many good reasons, in, in most cases, you don't want them to move this quickly. Um, so they have done a remarkable job under the circumstances um, but clearly we're seeing that the market is speaking on this. Um, it, it's not being taken up. We've tried to, we tried to put additional leverage in the discussions by together with our colleagues across the country, um, calling for something we, we hated to do. Uh, we, we prefer contracts to, to determine everything. Uh, but the temporary moratorium on, on commercial rent evictions to really allow for this cooling period uh, so that all of the data can come out so we can see what the uptake is uh, and allow the government, the tenants and the landlords to take another uh, sober second or third thought. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that there'll be changes and Quite frankly, if, if the rollout uh, is as long as it's likely to be, uh, then, then there will be very much a live discussion about extending uh, the rent subsidy, but no guarantees at this point. Bottom line, the federal government is already uh, in hock for an additional 250, 260 billion dollars that's twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars per household in Canada, and that's just this uh, last couple of months deficit uh, created. So, uh, at a certain point, also the printing presses will blow up. Um, Trace, can I just say something? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, Chris, just um, on the the rent uh, piece particularly, I think. Um, what we've been trying to get the government to understand is there, there can't be a cliff edge in the program. Things aren't just going to magically improve for companies as of July. Um, and the other sort of related piece of that is making sure that um, kind of similar to the wage subsidy program that the government, you know, be 
implementing some kind of sliding scale approach because what we don't want to have is a, a cliff edge where someone just happens to be one tenth of a percentage point below or above the threshold and then suddenly they're not eligible for the assistance anymore. It's going to take a long time for companies to ramp up. So we've been trying to ask them to you know, go down that route. Um, and I should say just as well too, I won't hold it against you that you're wearing a Gigi's uh, baseball cap. <laughs> <laughs> my son um, plays for them. <laughs> and actually, my daughter's at U Ottawa, so I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, Mark and, and, and Rocco, perhaps, I mean, recognizing that companies that are in stage three are going to continue to bleed even at a different pace than those that were able to reopen in some of the other phases. Has, have we looked at that perspective as well, to have that as a, as a threshold? And, um, to recognize? Um, so just from my perspective, I, I would say, I mean, we're agnostic on whether it's stage two, three, 3.78. Um, what matters more is actually companies sort of profit and loss uh, sheets and that being actually the, the, what should be the indicator rather than just an arbitrary, you know, your province has decided you're at stage X and therefore, you know, funding should go away. That's not what we think should be the criteria. Fair. Uh, we're in violent agreement uh, on that. Uh, I was speaking to one restaurateur who was actually saying, you know, Rocco, they're telling me I can reopen, but I can only have one third of my capacity. Um, I can actually go bankrupt faster operating that way than being totally shut down um, because I can't, you know, prorate all my costs to that level. So Mark is absolutely right. It has to be scaled. Um, to, uh, to, to revenues and to profitability. Um, and, uh, and it also has to be transparent, announced in advance so people can plan for it. Um, and with a sliding scale so that you can titrate off it. Yeah. Um, just building on that, uh, we have a business owner who, whose question um, is, uh, I would like to know what to do if my landlord refuses to apply for rent relief and my business has lost 95%. I'm gonna put this out there to all three of you. What, what is your advice on that? I'd probably defer to Rock and Mark. I can tell you I, 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 what I believe is I, I don't think there's much you can do. Uh, I think it's in there, it's up to them whether to apply or not. I've, I've actually been in conversations with with the business owners and landlords trying to encourage uh, uh, people to consider support where they're able to, and some of them are, are highly, uh, you know, highly um, um, difficulties themselves. But uh, I, I could be wrong. If anybody can correct me, but I believe uh, there, there's really nothing you can do if, there, if your landlord is not not wanting to access the program. The, the mayor is absolutely um, absolutely right. Uh, it's why we're continuing together with our colleagues at CCC to push. Um, because this is actually not the fault of the CMHC that is administering this program. They're living within the constraints that they have. Uh, this really needs to be the feds and the province um, getting back to the table and, uh, and working out a program that gets the money to the tenants so that they can pay. Um, because quite frankly, this isn't an issue of you know, there's some evil landlords who don't want to pay. I, I know circumstances where a landlord has told me, look, Rocco, yes, I've got this one tenant who's lost 80%, but I have another one who's also been with me for 25 years that lost 60%, so below the th threshold of the program. And if I do it for the one at... 80, 90, 95, and, but say no. It's easy for the government to say yes or no. They don't have to live day to day with these tenants, but I can either, either I can do it for everyone or I can't do it for anyone. And, and I have some sympathy for that argument. That's definitely a tough one. Mark, any, any thoughts? Um, I mean, I agree with what Rocco has said. I think what I would, um, you know, say is that, you know, never, um, you know, as much as the folks in Ottawa are working hard to make sure that, you know, these programs work for people, um, you know, they are, frankly, and I say this in a respectful way, 
uh, not necessarily appreciative of what the on the ground realities are for you know a lot of businesses. Um, and so I think you know when you have advocates like Tony who actually are connected to you as you know as the as constituents, um, I would really encourage you to actually be using Tony as a vehicle to make sure that those messages are being delivered to folks um, you know who are in the kind of government and permanently based in Ottawa just because they're kind of I think live reality and sense of perspective isn't you know the same as it is for folks like you who are actually on the front lines and you know literally seeing your cash accounts uh, suffer as a result. So I think you know getting the feedback either through you know Tracy, Rocco, myself or, or Tony um, to you know get that real message home is going to help make these programs actually work more effectively because what you need to have is the the landlord needs to be able to see you know frankly why it's in their self-interest to do so and I, I, and I don't Kind of be crass about it but i think that's just kind of the reality of, of human nature and certainly we've been telling the government to make these programs as straightforward as possible for landlords and everyone else to apply to as my as my dad always taught me statistics tell but stories and emotions sell so tell your story to your mp get it on the table um because when when people are are hearing real stories as opposed to theoretical circumstances MPs and, and ministers, they're humans too, uh, and that starts to have an impact. Um, Abdus, I noticed that uh, I, I can't see who, I think it was Christina Bizantz brought up the post promise um, about opening safely. I didn't, I didn't know if any of, um, any of our guests wanted to talk about that a little bit. I'm happy to, to talk about it. This is um, um, the brainchild of some uh, marketing people together initially with uh, the Business Council of Canada. Um, and, and what they wanted to create was a kind of a effectively Better Business Bureau seal of approval that you could have um, companies where the owners, the CEO make a promise uh, that they're following the five key um, public health uh, advice uh, elements and that this is being, um, that all of their employees are being trained and uh, that they're doing the deep cleaning, that they're ensuring physical distancing um, and those participating companies, and you can go to postpromise.com uh, to learn more. Um, I, I I wish, quite frankly, that the government had spent the money giving people more PPE so that they can make it um, uh, safer. But uh, Retail Council of Canada has come on board. A number of the big city chambers have come on board. Uh, and this is really goes back to the key. As long as we're living in a time when there is no vaccine, there is no way any of us can promise there will be no infections and no further deaths. So how do you build confidence for employees and for consumers uh, to participate in the economy? And this is one attempt uh, at that by having people pledge that they're, they're taking every single uh, step that they can. It's clearly not legally binding. It doesn't mean that there's no chance that uh, things will happen. Um, but it's, it, it's one step among many uh, to try to build that confidence in the same way that the moves made by the public transit authorities with respect to masks, that is fundamentally um, about building confidence. Masks, non-medical masks, do not protect you from, uh, from contracting COVID. They help to protect everybody around you uh from contracting it from you and so it's about respect and it's about limiting the damage and quite frankly it's a step a lot of companies longos in southwest uh, southern ontario and i know uh, through through the new market area were the first grocery chain requiring their customers to wear masks in order to shop there it was not required by guidelines and they took a lot of heat from many people who said hey like this is a free country. What what do you where do you get off telling me I have to wear a mask? And they said, we're sorry, 
This is the step we're going to take to protect our customers and more importantly, to send a message to our employees that we're doing everything we can to keep our facilities safe. So POST is, is one example of that. Yeah, and it's interesting, Rocco, because we heard from one of our local uh, retail chains, they have a, a number of stores throughout York Region, that they had also um, put the masks uh, in place as part of their policy. And same thing, they're getting a lot of flack, a lot of people um, threatening to sue over human rights. I mean, I'm hoping that will go away as people realize it's a, it's a matter of respect and it's a matter of everyone's safety, but I mean, it's hard for them to take a stand like that and then get the backlash. Yeah, and they're, and they're, they're charging for the masks, although it's, it's simply cost recovery. Anything above the absolute cost is going to the local food banks. Uh, but this is a big issue. I know that uh, TTC is going to be handing out the first million masks free, uh, but I'm assuming, you know, not all masks are created equal. These are not, you know, multi-use masks. I would, I would imagine them to be, uh, uh, to be more basic, uh, but, but these are critical steps we all need to be looking at. Sorry, uh, not to interrupt. We are coming up on time. And uh, Deepak, I noticed you wrote, raised your hand, um, Deepak, from the social, Sociable Restaurant. Do you have a question? Did you want to? Sorry, you're still on mute. You're still on mute. Yes, uh, thank you so much for providing this platform about. Uh, I was just having a couple of things like, you know, all policies and guidelines which are in place or forwarded to us, those are those speaks about you know the globally they are not like applied in every restaurant or is there is a uniformity which needs to be maintained like this is what we need to do for example a customer walks in in our restaurant he is supposed to wear mask by default it's something not a choice of the the any individual this is something if somebody is not wearing that is a threat to the to the medical fraternity to the other general public to the kids the families and stuff like that so that uniformity is something which needs to be adhered by the by every individual. And that is something in our guidelines is missing. If we can place some posters, like this is important, one need to wear definitely for sure. That is something very, very important and that is is need to be added into that. One is this. And second, I was uh, trying to figure it out, like if we are talking about, you know, uh, some uh, deferring of some payments, maybe rental or some other uh, mortgages or some other loans. End of the day, we have to pay. And as as Mr. Rocco said, there'll be there'll be lots and lots of, you know, uh, bankruptcies in the year in case, you know, we are deferring all the payments and we'll not be able to pay. Definitely it'll be like that. We need to look forward some solutions where we can, you know, earn money. If we make money, we pay to the employee, we pay to the government, government uh, for the taxes, and so on and so forth. Now, that being said, if we wanted to change some concept in our businesses, for example, uh, when I say, like, I, I am little away from the Young Street. I purchased this business just last year on 26th of March. On 17th of March, my restaurant was closed, not even a year. And I'm away, like if I want to go for a, a big digital sign, for example, on my pylon, which is on the Young Street. So is there any flexibility or leniency in the norms so that, you know, we can go for that and make some, you know, uh, out of the way, some promotions and bring back the business to my place? Those kind of things. I wanted to change the concepts, like, uh, for example, what to say, like something is not coming up in the zone or we cannot do that because of some zoning guidelines. So is there any way or any uh, umbrella under that where we can go and talk to them and define our situation and ask them to amend something so that, you know, we, we can come back to the business ASAP. So that, those kind of, you know, a support or you can say flexibility or leniency or whatever, because those guidelines were designed without knowing what is going to happen this natural calamity. But now things are changed. So can we expect some that kind of flexibility into that? Deepak, I think that would be an example where you could contact the chamber and we could help connect you in, in some of those areas. Um, and you're right, nobody expected this to come. So it does bring some new wrinkles around policy and advocacy, which is why the chamber and the network that is that is here today is there to support you. So we can we can take that offline if you want to just drop me a note. Appreciate it. 
Right, Tracy, I can offer a quick answer if you want. I know you're trying to wrap up, but on the one aspect, I think I heard you talking about signs, um, yeah. signage, et cetera. I asked staff last week, they'll be bringing probably the next committee to the whole or, or bringing to me directly uh, some information on uh, be it relaxing the rules on signs, extending the uh, periods and reducing or eliminating the fees. So that's being, and that would apply to everybody on the call. So I thought I would share that. Does that depend if you're on a regional road though? Sometimes that's why the, the connection piece, <laughs> he's off Young Street, so I wasn't sure on that one, but good point. We're looking uh, into all of that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. We are, sorry, we, Tracy, we are coming up on time. Um, okay. Uh, just a final question to all three. Um, when we talk about recovery, and that's really been the focus, we've gone from the initial comments were on a V-shaped recovery to a U-shaped recovery. Now we're at a, looking at a potential W recovery. Um, what what do you see as a key areas for, I mean, no one's uh, diluting that it's going to be a speedy recovery, but what needs to happen for a recovery to be efficient for us to move towards that path? Um, what are your thoughts um, from a municipal, provincial, and uh, Mark from a Canadian perspective, a macro level? Um, I'll, I'll jump in it because my answer would be very quick. It, it, it's uh, um, both the government and the public have to improve in some key areas. Um, the, uh, the government has to improve uh, in uh, tracking, tracing, uh, and, uh, and obviously working towards, uh, which uh, I can't speak to too much, but working towards vaccine, but tracking and tracing and managing uh, PPE, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the public and, and the business community, you know, and this is not a criticism, but we all have to get better at, at being vigilant, extremely vigilant. Uh, I believe strongly, we, th th it's almost limitless to what we can do if we all I strongly adhere to six feet hand washing and, I, and, uh, and uh, isolating when necessary. I think there's a lot we can do within those parameters if we do them. It's on both of us, it's on government, it's on the public, on business community to, to take on those areas and, and excel at them. And if we do, then I think the, uh, the, the recovery can be much less impactful and much quicker. I think he speaks for all of us uh, and I know we're at, uh, at time, so I, I don't uh, want to, um, extend it, uh, except to say that one of those key pieces is going to be daycare. Uh, we, we sadly have done um, a job with our seniors that we should be ashamed of. Um, and uh, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to put our children at risk uh, either. We want to do this as smartly as possible. Mark, any final thoughts? Um, I mean, as much as I'm like, you know, a guy who's, um, you know, always in favor of little government, I, I, I do think that the government assistance program rug can't be pulled out from under businesses. Um, you know, we're here because of the shutdowns and, you know, the economic situation that we have. So um, I, I just hope that the, you know, the scale back of those can be gradu gradual and certainly mindful of the, you know, business realities that all of you all, that all of you are facing uh, every day. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you to our, our panelists who joined us today, to Rocco, to Mayor Taylor, to Mark. Thank you for your time and for your insight. And thank you to all the businesses who joined us and continue to, to support us and to support you know, our municipality. Let's hope we're on our road to recovery. Have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs>